In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. <clears throat> I see there are scattered spaces here in the church. If you can, there are people standing in the back, so if you can just show them that you have a space next to you, that will be great. Just try to... It's great to, uh, to see uh, everyone. You know how it feels when, uh, when parents uh, in, invite all the kids from everywhere and have a family reunion or family gathering? That's how it feels when we, when we have one liturgy. Uh, I know it's tough for some people, and it's crowded, and I'm sure you, uh, you've seen the parking lot outside, but there is a sweetness out of this in the end. Um, and the reason why we're praying one liturgy, because Abuna Anthony had to... Uh, to go and speak in a, in a conference, youth conference in, in England. So uh, we, we believe in mission and we believe in serving other places and other people. So that's why we do what we do. And we travel just uh, for, for the sake of God's glory everywhere. But as I said, it's good to, uh, to have everyone together. Anyways, today's gospel, the born blind. And we remember this gospel is mainly read or the, the time that you remember most when this is read, it's read the Sunday before um, uh, Palm Sunday. It's called Baptism Sunday, Had Tanasir, or Sunday of the Born Blind. And there is a big correlation between this miracle, the born blind man, and baptism. And the reason why this gospel is read during this time, because we just celebrated Epiphany, which is the baptism of our Lord recently. Um, and the correlation between baptism and the born blind miracle, it's, it's amazing. Um, it shows that all of us, when we are born, we are born blind. Blind of what? Blind, blind of the spirit. Blind of spiritual life. Child, when he is born, he doesn't see any spiritual thing. He doesn't see God. He doesn't know God. Until God comes and make him born again through water and spirit. That's why the born blind washed with water. And that represented baptism. And through washing and believing in Christ, what happened to him? His eyes opened. And he started to see things that he never saw in his life. That is the situation of every believer when he believes in Christ. And when he is baptized and receive the Holy Spirit, he sees everything differently. And I promise you, this is the closest parable, or this is the closest analogy to anyone who gets to know the Lord. You know, who, how do I know when someone really repented, or how someone really changed when he comes to me, and he says, I see everything different now. How do you see everything different? First of all, materialistic things doesn't mean anything to me. I don't care about work anymore, even though I used to be workaholic. I don't worry about pleasures of the world. I don't worry about these things. I want to sell this house and get something smaller. I want to live a modest life. Why? Because there is something spiritual happened to him. His eyes now see more than the normal person or the earthly person. He is born of the spirit now. He is a child of God. He has new eyes that see spiritual things. So these spiritual eyes, or the, the, the baptism, we call it the sacrament of enlightenment. That God enlightens the person, makes him see what normal people don't see. So he can feel God's presence now. Now he can see there is importance for a spiritual life, for a spirituality. When he doesn't pray, when he's away from God, he feels like hungry. He feels that there is something missing. He has an extra sense that, does, that is not there for the normal person. Or you can give it another analogy also, is that you turn on the light. You plug the lamp and you turn on the light and here there is light. That's why in the readings today, it spoke about light a lot. In all readings, even in the Psalms, spoke about the light. And in, in, the, in the first, epi the, the Catholic epistle of St. John, it says that, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding 
or enlightenment. That's what I mean by, by this new eyes that God gives to every and each one of us. That we may know him who is true. It's being led by the Spirit. God opened the eyes of the born blind. Does that mean that he will see? Does that mean that he will see all the time? Does that mean that that said there is no darkness in his life? No. He has a decision to make. If he closes his eyes and walk his old life, for example, he didn't have any money. Okay, he didn't work any job. What do I do? Go back to my old job, begging. But, you know, now I can see. Okay, let me pretend that I'm blind. Closes his eyes, walks, and, and, and stumbles like a blind man. He can walk in darkness again. He has a choice now to see or not to see. He has a choice to open his eyes and to keep it open or not. Same thing. After receiving the Holy Spirit and after being baptized and after this enlightenment, it's our decision to live in light or darkness. To plug in to God and have this light or unplug and don't see anything and walk in darkness and lose all these senses, spiritual senses. <clears throat> Last week, when we spoke about John the Baptist, Abuna spoke about the new John the Baptist that comes to our conscience and says that there is something that needs to be changed and we have to, to listen to this voice, which is the voice of the Holy Spirit through repentance. That the Holy Spirit comes and see there is darkness here. You fix this darkness through repentance. And you fix it. Why? In order to walk in the light. In order to see God in your life. In order to feel Him. In order to be in the light. In order to stay in that light. So that's one thing, which is repentance, to clean the darkness that's inside. The other thing that I felt God is speaking to me lately, that makes us stay in the light, and makes us actually lie to the world, as Jesus told us. Actually, the Lord Jesus, he wanted us to be lamps, always shining, always plugging into the Lord in order to, play, to, to bring light to the world. And I felt that this plug-in thing comes through prayer. And I felt like the lack of prayer in our life is dimming that light that, gave, that God gave us. The reason why we don't see spiritually as we're supposed to see, the reason why we don't enjoy spiritual things is because this light is so dim because of the lack of of prayer, the lack of fuel. It's exactly like a lamp, but it's unplugged. Plug, plugging in is the life of prayer, to continue to take the charge from God. What God did is, He gave you that lamp, but it's up to you to plug it in or not to plug it in. And when you plug it in, you plug it into God through prayers. You plug it into God through prayers. No plugging in, no prayer, no light in our life. And we will go back to the darkness and to the old life and to the old man that we left long time ago. Actually, that's not a message for you. That, that's a message for me. And it's, it's a per personal message from God because a lot of times I'm helping people, guiding people, my job is to help people. And then I don't find enough time to pray. And God says, no, 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 that doesn't work. Doesn't work. You will not be able to, to give light to anyone or even you yourself to walk in the light unless you plug in and get enough charge for yourself and for others. You know what I discovered or what God showed me? is when I don't pray and work, work, work and do and serve and help people, I become efficient. But when I pray, I become effective. You know the difference between the two? Efficient and effective? Efficient is you can do more things. 
in short time and the same time. Effective is reaching the goal, doing what you want to do. Effective is reaching the goal. But efficient is doing a lot of things. I can do a lot of things, but in the end, they are useless. Right? I can preach, but it doesn't have power. I can tell people the truth, but it doesn't get into their heart. I can work hard, but there is no blessing. There is no return in advance. We become very efficient these days. We do 10 things at the same time, and we think we're so smart. But I'm afraid that we're not effective. We're not reaching the goal of loving God and loving others. You do a lot of work at home. Sometimes you spend a Saturday and you do a million tasks that you wanted to do in the house. But what is the joy of that? If you end up with a fight and everyone stays and sleeps upset, that's being very efficient but very ineffective because in the end, you didn't keep the unity of the house. And you didn't reach the goal. Why there is a house? Why there's things needs to be done in the house? Because to have family and to have love in that household. But if this doesn't, is not there, then we are efficient, but a lot of times not, not effective. We do a lot of stuff, but not necessarily what God wants us to do. That's efficient versus effective. Do we do what God wants us to do? Or we do what we're supposed to do, what we think is right, but maybe it's not effective. It doesn't bring fruits. It doesn't bring the goal. It's just wasting of time and wasting of effort in the end. Have you ever asked this question? Because a lot of times I ask this question a lot. What is going on? What's wrong? You fix one problem, there is 10 problems are waiting for you. You fix one thing, one thing, there is a million things is waiting to be fixed right after. Why, why life is just so hard? Why can't it be easy? Have you asked these questions before? Why it can't be easy? Why people are so annoying? Why can't they be helpful? Why, why can't they be normal? You know, normal. Why? Because I am normal. But you know what's normal? is I don't have eyes. That's the normal person. But the Christian person is not the normal person. He's got this, this new sense, this new spirit in him that see what people and normal people cannot see. A lot of times we wonder and we ask questions and we don't understand. And I, saw, I, and I call this a state of confusion. A state of confusion. And as this, or distraction. And this actually happens a lot to so many people. If I can say what people are, or what the status of people these days, confused and distracted. That's what I see all the time. And when you ask what is the reason, I think that's the real question. Because we are unplugged from God, from the light, the source of light in our life, through prayer. Lack of prayer is lack of God's presence in our life. Is this light is turned off? It doesn't work. Yeah, it is Christian. This is a lamp. Yeah, this works. But you need to plug it in through prayers. You know that this, the goal of this year for us in the church is to have something special in the church. To have growth in the church. To have revival. To have something amazing because when the state of the church goes up, then everyone goes up. But if the church is down, if the spiritual of the church is down, everyone will be down. And this is what we're longing for. This is what we're praying God for. A revival is strong. Something great happens to us. And God left us up in the church. And lately, when I was reading a book about that subject, about a church who had experienced great miracles and amazing things in the life of its people, and they said that never happened until the people, these people decided everyone prays individually in his house twice a day. 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. And when they did that, great things happened in the church. Anything good could happen without prayer? 
I don't think so. I would even wonder if something good comes that I didn't pray for, if this is a real good thing or a bad thing. Because anything that doesn't come from prayer, I wonder if it's a good thing or it's a bad thing. So, we hope that we get encouraged in the life of prayer, in our personal prayer, during this time, especially before Lent. So, I'll give you some quick hints about the life of prayer in order to get encouraged. And everyone here leaves promising God and deciding that I need to pray better and pray more. And the first thing is, of course, before you pray, you have to make the time. The problem is, a lot of times we're too busy. You know, but you will discover that the more busy you are, the more prayer you need. That you are busy, too busy not to pray. That's actually the title of one of the good books about prayer. Too busy not to pray. If you're too busy, you need it more than ever. I'm telling you. And the more I get busier in my life, the more that I discover I need more and more and double the time of prayer that I used to have. Because there is lots of things that I need to pray for. And I need more charging, you know, more charging for the job that God is giving me to do. That might never happen if you're not organized or you don't plan. If you don't plan your prayer, it will never happen. A lot of times when we don't plan things, we are, we, we're here in, a, in an organized community like everything is in order is with schedules and plans and things like this you have to plan in advance same thing like prayer if you don't plan the right time for prayer have you ever asked god to show you what is the best time best time of course different for different people you need to ask when it, when is this time and and how i really dedicate this time for god and actually that is the reason why we fast lent is give you a chance to concentrate and focus on your spiritual life and not on food and not on earthly things. There is no weddings in, in land. There is no celebrations. Why? Because we're so focused. Why? In order to free some time, in order to pray more. Spend more time for prayer. Instead of time for cooking and celebration and making things, there isn't any celebrations. So what do we do with this extra time? We pray. We save from TV. Why? In order to Pray more. We save some activities that we usually do during the time of Lent. Why? In order to save time for prayer. Lent hasn't come yet. It's not this Monday, next Monday. See some people, did Lent start and didn't know? No, we're just planning for that. And it's good to plan and it's good to make the time. The second thing that is very important is the personal prayer. A lot of people come in confession and say that the only prayer they do, they do it with people whether here in a church, with the family, with the kids, whatever, which is great, it's very important, but it will never, ever, ever replace the personal prayer. Your personal time with God. When, when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he told them, when you pray, what do you do? You go to your room, and you have shut down your door, so no surroundings, no nothing, you shut yourself from the world, and pray to your Father was in the secret place. Something personal. A lot of us lack this personal prayer. A lot of us lack the time we spend alone with God. Or at least this time is, is very short. And the reason why we can't do personal prayer much is a lot of times I don't know how to stay alone by myself. I don't know, maybe you discovered this about yourself before or not. But there is a lot of people who have this phobia that they can't stay just by themselves doing nothing. They either have to be on the phone or in front of the TV or busy or talking to some people. They can't stand just free doing nothing. And in order to overcome that, you have just to exercise being alone with no thoughts, with no occupancy, with any job you do, but you are sit sitting still in the presence of God and learning how to do that. That's the only way you practice personal prayer. We are in a so busy and distracted world. Unless you teach yourself and exercise how to sit by yourself 
for extended period of time, you will never ever learn how to pray. If there is no personal prayer, then we don't have prayer life. It's here in the church. We can only pray well here in the church when we have good personal prayer at home. No personal prayer at home, nothing works. Not with the family, not in the church, not with anything. It starts with the Father one on one. This personal prayer. And I want to check, I want you to check yourself. When is your personal prayer? When is the last time you stayed alone with God for an extended period of time? And now that I'm going to talk to you about the time. I know that we always say quality versus quantity. But when it comes to charging your battery and getting energy for the light, you need to charge. Basically, our life is like a laptop. We pray, so we plug it in. Okay? Charge. And then you go on through the day without the charging because you carry the laptop with you. But guess what happens after a little while? Needs more charging. You have to go and plug it in. That's our life with prayer. When I was going to Africa last November, I, ha I always have the problem of charging. When I go any place, I look for the plugs because I have so many gadgets that needs to be charged all the time. The phone, the computer, the iPod, everything. So I saw a new invention called solar charging. Don't get excited. Eh? So I thought this is going to solve my problem. And actually, the, it's like these, um, uh, these carts that are in the, in the airport. So the lady is there was actually a Coptic. And then uh, she doesn't come to this church anyway. So she, I asked her, is this real? Does it really work? She said, come on, Abuna, will I lie to you? I said, OK, are you sure? Because I'm traveling to Africa, and there is no electricity there, so I will rely on the solar system. She said, it's perfect. Even in the light. Here, you put it like this, charge. Charge your phone. You charge your iPod. You charge your computer. I said, this is going to solve all my problems, and life is so good. And I kept charging this thing for hours and hours and hours and hours until it's fully charged through the solar system. And I plugged it into the phone first to see. And the red, the, the, the red light started to go on, so it is charging. But after five minutes, it died out. And I discovered, yeah, it does charge, but for a very short period of time. And of course, I kept praying for this lady and asking God to bless her and bless her life <clears throat> because she uh, didn't lie to me. Because it really works, but for a short period of time. Just five minutes of charging, just to finish a phone call or something, but that's it. And you have to charge it five hours again through the solar system in order to give you a charge for five minutes. So what I did in the aeroplanes, I did what I used to do. You know how to charge a laptop in the aeroplane when it goes out of battery? Nobody gave you this hint before? Go to the bathroom. And there is a plug. There is no plug in the entire aeroplane except in the bathroom. But in order to charge a computer to last for a couple of hours, you have to stay longer. <laughs> and you have to act like you're constipated or something. <laughs> <laughs> and make sure that tell people outside that you're going to stay for long in order to ch charge all your gadgets before you go back to your seat. Don't do that <laughs> or else we abuse the system. But I usually do it when I really need to do it. Bottom line is, in order to find the energy, you have to plug in for an extended period of time. Not five minutes, not time, ten minutes. It needs a longer time in order to charge. We always say one, uh, uh, quality is very important. But quantity in prayer in order to charge, in order to turn on the light, you really have to charge for an extended period of time. I can't explain it in any other words. Uh, I can say it, I, I, I read a lot about leaders and spiritual leaders in the church. 
And everyone who is like a blessed leader and a good leader used to spend at least two hours of prayer every single day. Some people said, if I don't spend three hours of prayer every single day, it's a wasted day. These are very busy, extremely busy people in their lives. David the king, who was the busiest as a king and as a husband of, so, of, of wives and, and so many children, used to pray seven times every day. And he used to say that, I am a prayer. How do I gauge where do I stop the charging? Is that you don't leave until you are blessed. You remember the story of Jacob when he was praying all night? What happened to him? Then Jacob left alone. He was in trouble. And a man wrestled with him that was an angel or God until the breaking of day. So he stayed praying or wrestling with God all night. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. The angel or God told him, let me go. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Same thing. You never leave the prayer room until you are blessed, until you are charged, until the light becomes green. Or otherwise, it's going to die out after five minutes. Have you ever heard that? That I pray and I read the Bible and five minutes after, I go into a fight. Heard that so many times. Why? Because using that solar system, you know, that I'm telling you about. As a matter of fact, I still have it. If anyone is interested, you know, I'm not using it. Uh, it was $40, actually. I cannot forget these $40. In order to stay longer, people say, what do I do? What do I do? for? Like I stay, I can't pray like two, three minutes. W what do people do in two, three hours? The thing, the, the thing is that we need to understand is in order to get into the mood of prayer, it takes a lot of silence in the beginning and solitude, just sitting, closing your eyes, that's shutting the door, shutting everything around you and so focusing that you are in the presence of God until you know for sure you are in God's presence and you can tell that you are in the presence of God. Then... You start praying. And guess what? When you're in God's presence, who decides what is the prayer? You or God? Who decides how the conversation go? You decide what the conversation go? Or when you go and talk to your boss, who decides what is the plan and what is the agenda of the meeting? It's him. He decides. And we call this prayer led by the Spirit. Is that you let God lead you in prayer. You stay there in, in, in silence and quietness and then when the, when the Holy Spirit leads you will tell you what do I do now do I start with the Psalms or I start with, with of praising and saying hymns and songs for God or I start with pouring my heart out who decides that he decides that when you stay in his presence long enough to tell you what to do we call this a prayer led by the Spirit <clears throat> That's actually not my invention. St. Paul spoke about that. And he said, likewise, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, also helps in our weaknesses. What's our weaknesses? I don't know what to pray. For we do not know. That's what St. Paul says. St. Paul himself, he says, For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So the Holy Spirit will lead the prayer. That's a spiritual prayer. That's a prayer in the Spirit, in God's presence. <clears throat> and the Spirit will guide this prayer. <clears throat> Last thing I will say is commitment to prayer. After plugging and charging everything for an extended period of time, is that good enough for the rest of your life? No. You have to do this all over again. It's charging. That's why in prayer the Bible emphasizes so much is the consistency of prayer or being steadfast or continuing in prayer. Keep doing that. Keep the light on. Keep the plug on. Because once you stop, the light will dim and your eyes will, will stop seeing and you will be confused now and you don't know what's going on around you. That's why the Bible says, pray without ceasing. Continuing earnestly in prayer. Praying always with all prayers and supplication in the spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication 
for all the saints, continuing. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. Continue earnestly. That's the last one. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. And I hope that every one of us will never go home today without asking God to help us and lead our prayer that we can start a good prayer life. A, a life of prayer that's led by the Spirit. Led by the Spirit of God to enlighten, to give the light of Christ our life. To give us the sense that we see what God wants us to see. And I hope that this could be a good uh, goal and a good starting for, for Lent. Uh, before I leave and before we start the liturgy, I just remind you that today's schedule is the same as every week, Light and Life, and the parents' classes, Sunday school, everything is on schedule. Um, uh, and, and communion, I hope, will be fast because I will give the body and blood together, so we'll try to finish the same time we usually finish uh, the second liturgy. And as I said, uh, the, the, the schedule, everything is the same. I hope during when, when, when the deacons are, there is a hymn that they are praying now before we start the creed, that we close our eyes and, 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 and have a decision what to do in our prayer life before we leave. Today, Christ wants us to have eyes and to open and to see. And I promise you, without this life of prayer, uh, our, our eyes are dim and our spirits are dim too. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>